So there, there are four of us that are going to talk today, um, and what we're going to do is address different issues in privacy and on data security. Um, so it'll be myself. Uh, I'm, uh, so the, the session is uh, libraries and user privacy. Um, I'm Peter Brantley at New York Public Library, Gary Price at InfoDocket, Eric Hellman at Gluejar, Marshall Breeding at Library Technology. Um, and so I'm going to do a brief intro, and, um, and then we're going to have, um, uh, let me see if I can get the order, Eric, Gary, and Marshall uh, in succession. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give sort of a setting background uh, discussion of some of the major facets that we're concerned about, um, and then we're going to start drilling into some of the issues uh, relating to uh, libraries and privacy. So um, this became an issue greater than it had been um, because late summer, early fall, uh, there was now a well-known incident where uh, it was discovered that Adobe Digital Editions was transmitting information about uh, reader collections back to Adobe. And not only were they doing that, they were doing it in the clear, which is how, of course, people found out about it. So aside from the mind-numbingly stupid engineering um, at one of the partners that we do business with on a daily basis, um, I think the thing that was most shocking about this was the realization that um, there's a tremendous amount of information about what we read and what we consume um, on our machines and, and on the network that winds up being transmitted elsewhere. So this was uh, something that um, a lot of us started paying attention to. This particular slide um, is from a friend of mine, Liza Daly, who's the VP of Engineering at Safari. She was very instrumental in helping shape or understand the contours of this particular data leakage, as was Eric Hellman and a few others. There are a couple things I want to underline um, as sort of foundations. Um, one is that increasingly, as our services, as library services, start moving to the cloud, um, and as many of us experienced through the uh, discussion, the opening discussion of uh, this conference, um, there's an almost inexorable urge or momentum to moving our platforms into third-party services. Um, and as that happens, and as we get more skilled at manipulating um, open web software and designing solutions that take advantage of the opportunities uh, that open web software and hosted services provide, um, there are cases where our needs as organizations are not always going to align with our users, either, either because of defensive reasons, um, which could range from liability um, or security, network security for the organization, um, to proactive ones where um, we might want to design services that our users might not want to take advantage of because they require data gathering. The other clarification I want to make, a very important one, is that privacy is not security. Right? These are very different concepts, um, and they meld, and increasingly they're melding in really important ways, but it's important to distinguish them um, in your heads. So privacy at, at the most basic cut is you know, the information that's known about particular users, with whom it's shared, whether or not you've given permission to release that information to others. When we think about security, we think about sort of traditional IT-centric aspects of how we govern our organizational's network presence. So we think about things like defense in depth, intrusion detection, um, contingency and response protocols. And we also think about very discrete tools and services that we use to protect our networks. Things like data encryption, wire protection, uh, segmenting our networks, and firewalls. These are, are very specific things that we do to protect the security of information that flows within and through the networks that we operate. Now, the, the sort of raw data security, I think, had not been that much of a pressing issue for libraries, particularly um, despite the, the continual drum roll of data breaches that surrounds us in the news, um, except very recently there was a hack um, against the Wyoming State Library System, um, potentially by external um, out-of-state um, intruders that breached their online catalog. 
Now, on one hand, the data that's breached in an online catalog um, is not necessarily the most critical personal information. It's often purely directory information, and as such, um, might even be publicly available in many cases. Um, we are pretty good at throwing away circulation records, so that would not have necessarily been exposed in this case. But there are a couple things to note. Even, first of all, the, uh, the appearance of this is very poor, obviously, for libraries. The last thing that I want to see in the New York Times um, is waking up to discover that New York Public Library's patron database has been exposed and is now available for download on a torrent. Not exactly the kind of good morning America that you want to see uh, when you're working in a large institution. And the other reason, and, and a reason that um, Eric may touch on briefly, is that pieces of information cannot be considered in isolation. Information can be joined together and merged to, to learn more about individuals than might otherwise be apparent from just one data breach in isolation. So this, this combination of information um, brings out small numbers or actual identification problem uh, for our library users. So this concept of personally identifiable information is not just the information that might be held within any one particular database or any one particular network service, but really we need to think about what PII might, might be generated across services that individuals have access to. And personal information is really quite ubiquitous and in ways that we really often don't think about. For example, in a lot of urban libraries, there are actually video cameras aimed at least at the circulation desk to protect the staff there. This is a fairly common thing. But those video cameras are now digital cameras, and so they're recording data that itself could be prone to uh, digital analysis, like facial recognition, potentially available for uh, legal pursuit if that material is not regularly purged. We all know as IT people that we generate a tremendous amount of information in logs, um, and we are also cognizant that uh, inevitably there's retention of that information despite our best efforts to uh, eliminate information and, and backup copies. We design mobile apps increasingly that take advantage of common services um, and utilize the ability for individuals to log in through social media networks. Um, these kinds of logins uh, leak a tremendous amount of data um, into the networks utilized by the social media applications. And locations, um, geolocational software libraries are nearly ubiquitous at this point. And as a consequence, um, we at NYPL and many other libraries are interested in working with these services to provide better assistance to patrons wherever they happen to be in cities. So in short, increasingly, libraries are working in an environment where um, there's not only a great deal of data transmission, but we actually want, for our own purposes, to gather as much information about patrons as we reasonably can to create services that serve them in ways that they would not have been possible in older or more traditional libraries. And in turn, that orients a large urban library and certainly historically research libraries into single sign-on solutions, which enable the ubiquitous collection of information about patrons um, and users of our services, regardless of what kinds of applications that they, um, that they run across, whether it's a donation system or um, a journal application or an ebook platform. So in the current library, we have these conflicting aims of trying to figure out how to best protect the data that users generate and keep it internally safe and use it responsibly for generating new services while trying to ensure that as little data flows outbound as possible um, without the user's understanding and acknowledgement that this is indeed happening. Because it's, it's inevitable that there's going to be some data leakage. Um, through our networks. And I think that if we pretend that libraries are, inev are just going to be the last best safe refuge, we're really doing a disservice to our users and to ourselves as well. We really need to educate our 
our communities and our users about the way networks work and about the kinds of information that flow through them. So I'll end my opening here with this slide, which was a dialogue between Eric and Liza, the VP of Engineering at Safari, um, coming on the heels of the Adobe Digital Editions exposure. Um, and Eric had highlighted that even in Safari, which is a very reader conscious system, um, that there were cookies that enabled certain kinds of user tracking that Liza, as a VP of Engineering, um, had not considered uh, the full ramifications of. So Liza responds immediately and very responsibly that she'll restrict the scope of those cookies and prohibit or try to prevent the kinds of actions that might occur. And Eric closes with, um, I've yet to find anyone who understands the privacy implications of their own websites, himself included. And I think when we turn our eyes to the services that we're engendering in research libraries and public libraries, I think this is very much of a true statement. Um, and it behooves us to acknowledge that and work with our user community uh, to uh, deliver the, the most uh, informed dialogue possible uh, with our user community. So with that intro, I'm going to hand it over to Eric, who will dive in into much greater detail on these issues. So I, the last couple of years, I've been working on Ungluit. And what we are trying to do is make the world safe for free ebooks. And part of that mission has been to make Ungluit safe for libraries. And I had a librarian working for me for uh, two years, Andromeda Yelton. Uh, she was basically fresh out of uh, library school. And she really sensitized me to the importance that libraries, at least in theory, uh, uh, put on protecting user privacy. Um, but in this transition to digital information, and especially the transition from print books to e-books, uh, a lot of that commitment to user privacy has to be talked about in the past tense. <clears throat> So uh, why do I show you my Facebook page? Well, uh, just last week on Thursday, Facebook, whose business, by the way, is to be an advertising network. You may think that of them as a social network, but their real business is, of course, to sell you advertising. Uh, Facebook decided to show me an advertisement for uh, this book, which you probably can't read. It is the uh, architecture of open source applications, which we had just added to Ungluit. Uh, now, the reason it showed me an ad for this page is because I had recently visited, oh, let me show her. there, yes, that's the ad for the architecture of open source applications. Now, the, the reason um, that, that um, Facebook wanted to show me this ad and try to get me to buy this free ebook uh, was because I had uh, just visited uh, lulu.com where this, the print version of this book was for sale. Uh, and I, I seriously do not know why Facebook thought it would be a good idea to show me an ad for Fifty Shades the Musical. But So here, let me show you the the uh, web page for uh, at lulu.com of the architecture for, of open source applications. Uh, now, if you look carefully in the upper right hand corner, uh, you can see a little icon for uh, a, an add-on that I added to my Chrome browser called Ghostery. Uh, what Ghostery does is it examines the web page that I am looking at and tells me all of the tracking services that are tracking me as I read this web page. Uh, so Ghostery uh, has, I think, 30, 31 trackers that are tracking me. Um, and I hope by the end of this talk, you will have resolved to go home, install Ghostery into your browser, and start looking around and becoming aware of all the advertising networks that are tracking you as you go to different websites, and especially as you go to your own institution's websites. 
What uh, Ghostry also will give you a report on each of the tracking services. Uh, this particular one uh, uh, starts with AppNexus, which is one of the largest uh, advertising networks, uh, Burst Media, another uh, tracking network, uh, and down the list, 31 of these uh, things. Uh, so part of what um, Lulu.com is making money at is you know, providing services to help advertising networks like Facebook sell you the stuff that you know, they, they are, have on their website. Uh, so if you use Chrome, uh, you can turn on Chrome Developer Tools, which, which will tell you all the requests that your browser makes to build this web page. And uh, so this is, this, is the, the, this is the request that it's making to Facebook. Way too small for you to see. Sorry about that. Um, and it tells you all of the information that Lulu is telling Facebook about you. So uh, uh, the address, it, you know, it sends the request direct to Facebook, you know, Facebook Connect Advertising Network. All right, it gives the full address of the page that I'm on at lulu.com that usually for reasons of, of uh, search engine optimization contains the full name of the book that I'm looking at. It's the referrer header. Uh, and it also uh, sets a bunch of tracking cookies. Um, what the tracking cookie does is it's set by Facebook. And whenever I go to a website, uh, my browser reports to Facebook whatever's in this tracking cookie. This particular tracking cookie identifies me as an individual user of Facebook. It, it, it gives information about other places that I've been. Apparently, I had been on the Ted Cruz website. That I'm telling to Facebook, too. Oh, and by the way, my browser also sends the do not track header to Facebook. Uh, the do not track header tells Facebook that I do not want to be tracked. Facebook laughs at my innocent naivete about advertising networks <clears throat> and tracks me anyway. Uh, it's not like the library world is all that much different from a commercial service like lulu.com. Uh, this is uh, looking at the ghostry report for WorldCat for exactly the same page in WorldCat. Uh, WorldCat uh, uses, sends all this similar sort of information to add this uh, to Omniture, which is part of Adobe, which uh, Adobe does various uh, tracking to uh, help Websites optimize uh, the, their delivery of content, um, including many organizations other than OCLC. Uh, and, but I don't want to give you the impression that OCLC is, is an outlier in this by any means. I was going to put up New York Public Library, but since I, I uh, made a presentation to them a couple of months ago, uh, since then they have removed uh, a, a bunch of the tracking services that, that were on their website. If I go to my local public library catalog, this is the Bergen County uh, Cooperative Library System, or Buckles. Uh, they also use this uh, service called Add This, which uh, reports all my browsing information at Buckles to their advertising networks. <clears throat> uh, they, they use a Polaris catalog. Uh, but again, it's not just one catalog vendor or, or one website. <clears throat> uh, let me tell you a little bit about Add This, since I've mentioned that both for, for uh, OCLC and for uh, Buckles. Uh, what they do is they provide share widgets. Uh, those are the things that you click on a, on a web page to, to share your behavior with Facebook or Twitter or, or, or um, any of the other social networks. Um, because they do this, they know who people are, because they, they, they track them to their 
you know, if you ever use any of the add this buttons to post anything, then you have just given um, add this your personal information and identity on these social networks. Uh, they're also notorious for having deployed canvas networking, no, canvas, canvas fingerprinting, which is a technology that allows them to track you even if you erase all their tracking cookies, even if you turn off cookies completely, they can still track you. And they've used this, this, uh, <clears throat> this technology uh, to respawn cookies so that if you delete the cookie, they, they track you across deletions. <clears throat> and of course, uh, it, it, you, know, there, you can find them on 5,000 of the top 100,000 po most popular websites. They, of course, have a privacy policy. Their privacy policy tells you that they set cookies for their partners to help them track you on the internet and allow, you, allow their partners to deliver targeted advertising. <clears throat> well, so what? Uh, we live in a post-privacy age to some extent. Um, but I, I want to remind you of, of the story about the six blind men who, when presented with an elephant, came back with a completely different description. Uh, one of them you know, felt the tail and thought the elephant was sort of a rope-like thing. And another felt the trunk and thought it was more like a snake. And another one felt the ear and felt it, it was sort of like paper. Another one felt the elephant's stomach and thought it was a wall. Well, it was only when they started talking among each other that they realized that they were all measuring aspects of a single identity, uh, entity. Once they were able to put that all together, they were able to have a picture of what the whole elephant was about. And that's exactly what tracking networks do. <clears throat> um, now, you know, a library that's reporting information about web pages, they're only, you know, they're not really reporting personally identifiable information about a user. They're just saying what the book, what books the person is reading or interested in reading. Uh, but because these social, these advertising networks place their beacons across the entire internet, they can, uh, each of them reporting back the identity of the user that is uh, making all these requests, um, the, the, the advertising network can determine the social identity. Uh, it can determine what the, the person is buying, who their friends are, um, what contacts they make, uh, what websites they visit, uh, geo, um, geodata that tells them where these people are. Um, and so by putting all of these pieces of information together, the advertising networks uh, assemble a portfolio of information about people that makes it easy for them to, to, to advertise whatever they're selling. Two minutes left. Great. Well, there are lots of advertising networks. This is a, a list of advertising networks that are active out there. Some are bigger than others. Uh, some of them are specialty networks. Uh, but they all basically engage in a business where they are oriented to collecting data about users and helping advertisers sell stuff. Uh, so I, I don't have the last slide because I, this was a different presentation. Uh, but just to tell you, um, I've been blogging about this at my blog, Go to Hellman. And, uh, there's just all sorts of stuff going on, and I would please ask you to think about what your websites are doing and not betray the trust, the substantial trust that users are placing in you to use their personal information responsibly. Thanks. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. A lot to share with you in a very short amount of time. Um, just to wet your whistle, to continue on what Eric was speaking on. This takes, what you're seeing right now is a literally a live stream 
of all of the internet traffic going through the router in this room and throughout the hotel on this particular network. I am not a hacker. I am not even a developer. I'm just somebody who's been very interested in this topic now for probably about five years. And I've learned if on a scale of one to 10, I'm probably using this particular tool, which is called Wireshark. I am probably a two or a three. But what you're seeing here, and we'll get, I'll go to some in-depth pictures using some of my personal searches in a moment. But this is a live stream that, with a little bit of knowledge, and there's a lot of documentation. You can go down to actually what is being sent over the network. I'll let us see several people, Roger and others, taking pictures. Here, we'll make it nice and big for you. You're welcome, Roger. Um, so that's that. Now, let me go here. Oh, the follow, also the follow-up on what Eric was saying so nicely. Uh, what you're seeing here, let me close this out, let me close this out. What you're seeing here is something called light beam, and this works for, um, this works for Firefox, and you're seeing all of the websites and the third-party cookies and third-party trackers that Eric was talking about visualized using the triangles and circles. Circles are sites that I visit on this computer, so here's my own site info docket, and that, set, and that sent a cookie, or Scrib set a cookie on my site because I embedded something. Here, for example, is a YouTube. That sent a, set a cookie to restaurant.org for some reason. The big circle here is Google. Uh, Google, for example, was informed of my visit to this windcap.org site and so on and so forth. So you can see, for example, just by going to, um, this is ajax.google.apis.com and siserver.org was, uh, this site, googleapis.com, was informed that I was at siserver.org to get the necessary data. What each Google cookie is and what it means, is you'll probably also know, uh, government uh, EU law, did they actually have to tell you that they're using cookies? And I don't believe that, uh, a government mandate is needed in the United States uh, and North America for libraries to do more and to share more and to be more transparent. The library community has wanted everybody else who has data to become as transparent as possible. We need to do the same. And let's talk again about a quick live demo before we get to the next speaker. Uh, so we saw Wireshark. This is, is there anybody from Iowa State? Anyway, no? This is a tool called Cookie Cager. And what this is doing is collecting all the cookies that are flying over the internet um, on a particular router or through ethernet. And as you can see here, every person on the network, whether you're on a mobile device or, uh, or laptop, every device has a MAC address, a unique identifier. This will actually pull that out. Of course, you could do it with Wireshark, but this makes it a lot easier. So here's the MAC address for my computer. This, I per, this identifies me. And now you can see all the non-encrypted data that goes from my particular computer over the internet, non-encrypted. So just to give you an idea, save time here, I did a search with Peter's permission of New York Public Library's OPEC. And as you can see here with my search, Oh, and by the way, as you can see cursor over, I also know the type of browser the person is using. Um, and I know some other technical details about um, the computer. But as you can see here, I can actually double click on this and I can actually see the search, the actual search terms that I used um, searching nypl.org. And, and Marshall will get into more about other vendors but this is the case with a lot of database and OPEC vendors. It is going over the internet. So if what Peter said in the, uh, at the beginning, if the Adobe issue was and correctly was an issue for the library community, this also should be as much of an issue, if not more, because it's happening all day, every day. Not only from OPEC vendors and OPEC databases, uh, but also from from vendors, uh, from, uh, from database vendors. So, let me, so that's an idea of what it looks like. A lot of times, too, um, there is personal search information that's sent through the different uh, analytics. 
And let me go up here to a couple slides that I'll finish off with here. One thing you know is Google Books, for example. The Google Book search is encrypted, is HTTPS. But when you actually click on a Google Book entry, it's not. So here you can see that I was looking at a book, the front cover of a book, and the search that I did to get to the book was the Chicago Cubs, my lonely hometown baseball team. Uh, so, you, so Google, the search is encrypted, but the actual Google book entry page is not. Here is, so here's another example of that. I did a search, there it is, Flintstone. In some cases, when, I, when you saw scrolling earlier in my presentation through Wireshark, very often devices are named for the actual person using it. It's often set that way by default. So I was gear, so on my iPhone this morning, it was set up, I, I changed it just to show you. I was library.gary. I then changed it and I became Fred Flintstone. So, Many, so for those of you who are using different types of devices, your name is all, your actual name, sometimes first name, sometimes last name, sometimes both, is being picked up by different device, by different uh, sniffing tools like I was showing you. And then here's another example from a specific vendor. You can see the DOI is being transmitted. So now I can find out the particular article that I, you could find out the particular article that I was looking at because, again, the MAC address is unique to a specific person, to a specific device. And then finally, I was looking at a large, well-known vendor of legal databases. And actually, I was, I was working yesterday in a large coffee house. And somebody on there was actually searching. And I blanked it out. But they were actually searching. I could see what legal database they were searching and from the particular vendor. In some cases, I was able to see the client ID number. And then finally, here's Google Analytics. In this case, from an academic library at .edu. Through Google Analytics, I can actually see the search somebody was doing. So all of this is out there. And I think that, as you've heard, we all need to do more to inform our users and to work with vendors to make it more, uh, to make it more difficult for them to access. Thank you. So my part of the panel is to talk about the state of the art or the state of practice when it comes in the way that basic library automation discovery systems treat library uh, privacy and data, at least kind of at the network and security level. Some of these questions have to do with privacy, some have to do with security, you know, I think they're pretty tightly uh, interlinked in a lot of ways. It's, you know, it's incredibly startling to, to think about anything that you transmit on your, from your library's web page over the internet, uh, whether it's wireless or wired, is kind of out there for public inspection. So as we think about the privacy that we provide for our patrons, our community members through our systems, it's important to pay such close attention to how well we guard that information. So I did kind of a little mini study uh, for this. Uh, as I often do, I kind of picked a handful of the major library automation vendors, and you know, I'm really delighted that they're always kind of able to kind of tell me uh, things about their systems that then I also kind of verify through kind of my own uh, knowledge and, and other folks that use those systems. So I invited you know, this cast of providers to respond to a number of questions that, that I came up with that kind of target the, the question in mind. <clears throat> And think of this as just kind of an introductory study of the conversation. Uh, I think that we should do, I plan to do a lot more in-depth investigation in the topic. Um, so, you know, this is just, I don't want you to think that, you know, I've done a, already a comprehensive study. There's a lot more left to be done. Um, you know, and, uh, and it only looks at one piece of the puzzle. We're mostly looking at from the patron uh, facing interfaces, online catalogs, and discovery systems, and then basic handling of the way that libraries kind of manage and store the data. So I sent them, um, it's about 25 questions, I guess, in these different categories. Um, 
you know, the ones I think are most interesting and important is the first set having to do with kind of patron-facing interactions, uh, and then, you know, because staff networks are vulnerable as well, uh, the clients, and then how are data stored in library systems? Is it encrypted or not? So if somebody does manage to compromise the system and get the patron file, is it going to do them any good? Well, yeah, it is. It's just all in the clear. Or is it encrypted and, and very difficult to break? So those are the kinds of questions that uh, I asked and kind of even floated the idea, do we need to have some kind of security compliance framework so that library providers and library users can agree on what the standard, uh, the way that data are going to be treated uh, within any of these systems. So I think that the, the gold standard is that we encrypt everything. But library catalogs come from a longer history where that wasn't considered necessary. Uh, I think that you know, we, we know that we have to encrypt things like the handshake that you do for authentication. You know, nobody would have a user sign on that didn't have some kind of encryption for that process and some kind of hashed password, salted hash, and the way that that's stored, just as you gain access to the system. Uh, and some kind of only do that, and some do others. Uh, so it's interesting that there are very few that have comprehensive encryption. And it's enlightening to think that the one that does it is one of the smallest vendors. Uh, there's this uh, vendor called Biblionix, has this public library system called Apollo. It's a relatively recent uh, multi-tenant software as a service offering, but they encrypt every page that they deliver to both their staff and their patrons. And as far as I know, among the ones that I that we're talking about here, none of the others are doing that. But you, you can't, when you go to Facebook, when you go to Google, you know, they have gotten to the mode of encrypting everything. And I think that's what libraries have to get to as well. Billy O'Common says that they're going to be in that mode in 2015. But pretty much all of the others say, you know, we think about, you know, does it have patron details? Does it have uh, sign-on information, yeah, we'll encrypt those because those are the important ones, those are the sensitive ones. Well, you're right, you don't want to expose a phone number, social security number, PIN or password, so we encrypt those, but the entire stream of a search describes what that community member is searching for, what they looked at, and what they read. So in the same way that we wouldn't turn over circulation records to anybody who asks, you wouldn't turn, you wouldn't expose all of that in the network in the clear. So I think that's kind of where we're getting to now is the idea that the whole thing has to be encrypted if we really want to take the idea of patron privacy, uh, patron privacy on the network these days. So, you know, selective, and then some are all or nothing. You can, uh, especially some of the open source systems, you can say, well, we'll, we'll encrypt everything or we won't, but it's kind of left up to the library uh, or the provider for that library. And my observation is that the practice is that mostly it's in the clear. Uh, you know, I searched tons of library catalogs in, in my research and, you know, it, I very rarely see uh, examples of where the whole data stream is encrypted. I'm going to skip over all of this. Let me uh, just say that I can. I did this study. I tabulated it. Uh, I'll I think uh, uh, I'll publish the the results of that in my next Smart Libraries newsletter. So that'll be available through LA Tech Source uh, soon, and. <clears throat> that uh, it'll be available after the embargo period on my, on my website. Uh, so the staff functionality deals with even more sensitive information, uh, more sensitive to the library as well. I mean, our financial information, accounts, and all those kind of things. We certainly want those to be carefully uh, encrypted from kind of a business uh, you know, continuity point of view and business details and uh, money and accounts and all of that. Uh, so is that handled by the application automatically? The state of practice is very uneven. Uh, there are some say, well, if you're worried about that, send it through a VPN. 
you know, in general, you know, that's not a, you know, the best answer. You can do that. That will work. But, you know, most of us who use VPNs know that it's, it's kind of a hard thing to do and it's kind of tricky for remote access. The other question I asked was, how are things stored internally? So in other words, if someone does compromise your system, is it going to be kind of easily available information or is it encrypted? Uh, again, it's very spotty. Uh, and I would say it's more than spotty. There's mostly a practice of non-encryption except for passwords uh, and things like social security numbers, but general patron details or address and all of that, even if it's transmitted on the wire with encryption, it's probably stored on disk in the clear. So again, I think that there's concern for all of that. Data comes in and out through systems on the back end, through application programming interfaces and library protocols like NSIP and SIP, which are sometimes secured and sometimes not. So I think we have to look at the leakage of the system that can happen on the back end that often is still transmitted over a network, uh, often unsecurely. So one question I floated is that do we need to have some kind of compliance framework, informal, formal, I, you know, it's too early in my thinking to even uh, come to any conclusions, but in the same way that we know we wouldn't transmit credit card information over the wire without a certain agreed upon set of controls being in place, what are the controls that we need to have as we transmit patron data of any kind, including session data, over the wire? So we need to educate ourselves about what the issues are. I hope that's what part of this panel is. And then start thinking about what the methodology would be for defining those questions and asserting compliance or not. Uh, so I already said that we'll make these, this information available. But, you know, the meat of the question is, what are we going to do about this? I think it's really critical that if we take the library ethic about patron privacy seriously, then we really have to adjust the way that we treat patron data on our networks uh, in order to ensure more security. And the basic step is just end-to-end -end encryption to have comprehensive SSL for all of the transactions that libraries conduct between their users and the public. Uh, so I would like to see uh, more awareness and there's a lot of ability to do things about this within the configuration of the products we've talked about and in the vendors kind of offering this as kind of the default delivery of these systems. We need to know to ask for it and I think that's part of what we, what we want to do. And I would say that there's no time like the present. I think that if there was kind of an insistence from the library community, this is something that the vendors could deliver in pretty short order. Uh, wouldn't it be reasonable for, in the same way that Google and Facebook changed in 2013 to comprehensive encryption of, of delivery of their services, that the libraries make that a goal? Let's do this by next year. So there's nothing technically hard about that. There's the computing power to do it. It's just kind of the knowledge and awareness and, and the urgency to get that done. So that, I think, is kind of the, my ending point. And the other thing is that no matter how secure these systems are, we keep inserting them with non-insecure things. Like you can take a perfectly uh, secure library catalog and then put all of these added and other kinds of widgets in it that then kind of corrupt that. So it's not relying on the vendors and the online catalog, but for libraries to do comprehensive audits of the systems that they assemble out of all these pieces and parts in order to understand the leakage, the exposure, the security, and the privacy. So I think that's my time, and thank you. OK, with that, we are over. So thank you very much for your attention. We really appreciate it.